welcome to Weird Talking, the show that explores the unknown with your hosts, Rhys and Chris. And on the show, we take a look at the latest news headlines circulating in the internet, and we're talking to our special guest, Brian Allen, about his work and his research. Rhys, we're going to be talking about some of the latest news headlines that have been going around the internet. But, but before we do that, I just wanted to announce something about the Weird Conference this year. As you know, we've been doing conferences since 2009 and we were planning to do a 2012 conference but we've been talking internally and the news is that we're not going to be doing one this year now this is quite sad but we will be back in 2013 and in the meantime you can listen to what's going on weird on this show and obviously look on the website where we've got all the news going on what do you think of that then that's really sad news chris but i'm sure we'll be back next year with a bigger and better show than ever before Absolutely. And I think what we want to do is something original as well. So something you haven't seen before. And I think giving us a year off will allow us to plan that and come back with something bigger and better than we've ever done. So what's been going on in the news then, Rhys? Well, there's a few stories circulating the internet this week. First off, I'd mention that the game, a much anticipated game called Mass Effect 3, yes. has actually got, par, as part of its marketing campaign, a petition to go on to the UK government's um, website and petition the government basically for the release of further UFO information. So aside from the fact that we've already had quite a, a large number of releases from the MOD in the, the past few years, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what more the government are actually holding. But in any case, as it's part of a marketing campaign, that would eliminate Mass Effect 3 from actually being party to the official government's petition. Yeah, but it's worked a little bit as in people like us are talking about it, I, I, I guess. Exactly, that's what they hope for. <laughs> I played Mass Effect, it sucks, don't, don't get it. Um, oh, I, I played the second one, so that wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting back at them for, um, for putting out headlines like that, really. Further this week, the Mirror.co.uk reported on new Roswell UFO footage that's oh, been yes. as the best, the, the best flying saucer clip ever recorded. <laughs> and if you've ever seen even just a small number of UFO clips, you'll know that it's not the best, but it looks rather suspiciously like CGI, especially out of the film Iron Sky, that kind of CGI flying saucer coming past. And if you do get to watch the clip, if you pause it at around about 10 seconds in, you'll actually see the the saucer one minute is in front of a barrier and the second is actually behind the barrier where they've done some poor editing of the the, the actual saucer that they're claiming is real. So um, we here at Weird certainly wouldn't recommend that as a the best flying saucer clip ever recorded. Yeah, it's always the best ever evidence, the best ever footage, isn't it? And it turns out to be quite pants, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what we ought to do is have a competition, right? We ought to launch a competition to win a weird mug to send us the worst or the best in a kind of sarcastic way piece of footage of ufos on the internet today and we can uh, cover those on our news site and put like the worst 10 ufo video clips from youtube on the site so we might do that what do you think <laughs> yeah. um it, it wouldn't be too hard for people to come up with really 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 bad <laughs> ufo <laughs> clips but just uh, the state of what's circling the internet at the moment unfortunately i think it would be funny so i tell you what if you are out there and you're listening to the show and you can find 10 of the worst UFO clips on YouTube. Send us an email to the contact us at weirdwiltshire.co.uk. And if they're really, really bad, I will send you a weird mug as a, as, as a gift and we'll cover it on the site. How's that? <laughs> I went down to Wales two weeks ago to interview a new witness to the Warminster case. Now, if our listeners are familiar with Warminster, I think I cover it briefly in the article I posted on the site anyway. But back in 1964, there was some disturbances that kicked off and it all kind of really, in one respect, got out of hand with national media and people flocking to the town. And I interviewed this witness and, and basically what he was saying was, you know, one winter, I think in 1971, he saw a an object, he thought it was a meteor at the time, but it was moving too slowly, it actually impact the ground just north of the army base, uh, just short of Salisbury Plain. So I spent a wonderful afternoon down in Wales talking to him. He's an extremely genuine guy. I posted up a kind of 
overview of that on the news site. You can have a read of that, but it's very interesting. So I don't know if you're familiar with Warminster, but um, what do you think of these kind of hot spots that we have in the UK, Rhys? Well, to be honest, I've never actually visited any of the hot spots in the UK, so I've only ever read about them from news articles and things like that. It's something that I'm always a little bit suspicious about when something becomes a hot spot. Um, you get one major incident that could be a hoax, and the next thing you know, the the rest of the population seem to be seeing things. Mm. It's kind of got a, a psychological knock-on effect to it. But then I'm being slightly skept- skeptical, I suppose. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was it was an interesting meeting him because you know he was there, he was posted there at the barracks for 18 months, and um, although he saw a few things. The feeling I got from him was there was no importance attached to anything that was going on there because they didn't really know about what happened a decade almost earlier. And it was only later they found out about, you know, the thing and Arthur Shuttlewood and what was going on in, in, in that era at the time. But I just got that feeling that the army just didn't seem to know about it. You know, it was something that was going on outside of their kind of jurisdiction and they just weren't interested. So kind of very, very, very interesting. Yeah, and um, even your witness said that it it, it was an unofficial investigation that they kind of took and they they went there and had a look for themselves. Yeah. And they didn't actually make anything official out of it. And I suppose maybe that's part of the whole era back then in that you didn't actually talk about those kind of things. Otherwise, you'd be in, at risk of losing your job. Well, there, there is that, isn't there, with airline pilots and uh, and, and ridicule, I suppose, going on by your peers but I, I think they actually went to investigate it because they were bored I think I think that was actually the feeling I got was you know I've been on guard duty for several hours and this thing happens oh let's just go and have a look then it breaks up the evening I don't think they thought of it as anything particularly weird or strange the strangest thing I find is the, the fact that there was no impact when they they seemed certain that it, it came down and there should have been an impact site yeah but I think it's a bit like trying to find the end of a rainbow you know you think you know where it is and then it's not there anymore it's, it's miles away you know who knows so, Rhys, that's the, the kind of latest news that's going around this week. Uh, it's been a quiet week for news, or at least news that I'd like to post on the site anyway, let's put it that way. So it's time to go and speak to our guest, the one and only Brian Allen. Now, if you've heard of Brian, you must have heard of Brian. He is a prolific author, and he's a wonderful, wonderful, charismatic Scotsman, and we'll be talking to him after this. Brian, so hi, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me on. Ah, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. We've been sort of with you now for about three years as Weird and Brian Allen working together. First met you at 2009 at our Weird 09 conference where you gave a talk on Roslyn, which was fantastic. So what's been going on in your life since then? Oh my goodness. <laughs> where do I start? Um, well, I've produced a couple more books. Um, there was Dark Messiah. That came out, um, that incidentally ca- carries quite a sting on its tail, quite literally. Um, there was Dark Messiah, I've done a few more investigations. I've just completed a brand new manuscript, which is still waiting for the publisher. It's called um, I Cast the Out, which is about exorcism and possession and religious hysteria. Um, I, I, that was quite an, an interesting piece as well. And I can say that, that after having written um, The Dark Messiah, I was very circumspect about how I approached this project because Dark Messiah was was quite alarming. The after effects were, if, if, if you'd like to hear about them. Yeah, sure. What happened? Well, I couldn't remember if I told you this before, but uh, obviously I haven't, so so, so that's fine. I, had, I was in the process of finishing the manuscript, and in fact, sitting in the very room where I'm sitting just now, where I've got my little office, and, you know, my, my, my couple of computers and things, and... Yeah. Um, I just completed a, a chapter about the Black Mass, and I'd been researching it for about a week. And just as I finished it, I went cold. And I, I don't mean it got chilly. I mean, in a nanosecond, I, I went stone cold, and not from the outside, but from the inside out. Now, stuff like this has happened to me before, because as you probably know, I've researched the paranormal for a lot of years, like put it that way. Indeed. And I, I knew something had happened, and I thought, oh, no, not again. So I tried to get out my mind and gradually my body temperature heated up again and everything was fine. So I didn't dare mention it to Anne, my wife, who you obviously know you've met two or three times. That night we went to bed. I didn't think about any more about it because everything went back to normal. I thought, well, I guess it's okay now. So um, what happened was we went to bed that night and about two o'clock the following morning, we both woke up simultaneously. It was pitch black 
and we could hear scratching. And this scratching was coming from the floor, it was coming from the ceiling, and it was coming from the walls. In fact, the whole room there was scratching all around the room. And, and it wasn't just, 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 just a very light sort of tick, tick, tick. This was heavy clawing sounds. Yeah. So this lasted for about two or three minutes. And for the first time in my life, I was frozen with fear. I've heard the expression frozen with fear. It's the first time it's happened to me. I was frozen with fear. I could not move. Oh my gosh. And my wife was also terrified. Um, in fact, she was so frightened that, we, that she couldn't put the light on. Now, this scratching kept getting louder and louder. Then we started hearing bumping sounds as if the furniture was getting moved around. So we were both, as I say, absolutely terrified. And we just lay there. And after, I guess, I glanced at the clock. It must have been taking about 20 minutes, all told. And, and the sound faded away and faded away and faded away and finally stopped. I guess it would be about 3 o'clock. And neither of us could sleep. Just we couldn't go back to sleep again. Now, Anne knew what had happened but didn't say it. And I knew instantly what had happened. Because that, this is the second time this has happened in the house, purely because of my interest, for want of a better word. Yeah. The following morning, after I'm going to work, as you probably do, I've retired now. But I got up on. I got up the following morning and went to work. And I did stuff, and I walked around the house and I cleansed it, and I asked whatever it was. In fact, I didn't ask it. I told it to get out of the house, and unfortunately, it hasn't come back. And that's I guess 18 months now. But that is the second time I've had to cleanse this house um, because of things that have latched onto me, or that have inadvertently brought into this reality mm. through research have been doing. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not for the pain of half to put it that way. So the last time I spoke to you, you were uh, talking about Roslyn Chapel. And yes, you were going to be doing some follow-up work in the chapel with some mediums and trying to open that door. Yes. Have you done anything more with Roslyn? And, and if so, what, what happened? Oh, what happened? Well, um, t- to be honest with you, it was, it was a case had been overtaken by events. I just didn't get a chance to go back there. Mm. Um, and, and it all sort of it all sort of faded into the distance because I, I was working on new, on new projects, um, I, I was working on the new manuscripts. There was articles. I started then, then I got involved with this magazine and all sorts of stuff started happening. But um, the thing was that, um, and again, this just shows you how synchronicity works. I was approached about three weeks ago, a month ago, maybe yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah three weeks ago by people that I've worked with before, guys that live in London, a guy called Patrick McNamara, who is a physical medium, and another guy, um, Carl, uh, Carl Fallon, who helps him out. Carl is IT, and um, he also sort of films all the sort of seances that, that Patrick conducts. The, the, the website is called ghostcircle.com, all the world, ghostcircle.com, if you want to have a look at this. Mm. But, uh, but there is some pretty interesting stuff. Now, I, I worked with them previously. We carried out an experiment at a, a former um, Cold War nuclear bunker just outside St. Andrews, which is currently run as a, as a tourist attraction. But um, we got permission to go in there and, and carry out some experiments in physical mediumship. Mm. And this was all t- this took place like 30 metres below ground um, at like 2 o'clock in the morning. It was quite interesting, and we saw some interesting stuff, but, but, but that's another story altogether, and I'm not going to get involved in that. But about three weeks ago, we would always kept in touch, just you know, the, the odd email, the odd phone call, how you doing, mate, all fine, this, that, and the next thing. But anyway, Carol got back in contact with me and said, well, look, he said, what is happening at the Roslyn Chapel? Because we ourselves got tied up with other stuff, but we'd like to go back in there to carry out a series of experiments in our own right, because as you probably remember, Chris, we did this stuff with the Roswell Frequency yes. and, uh, in the chapel. Well, um, I said, well, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'd, I'd quite like to uh, go back into the chapel and have another shot with, with the stuff we've done. Now, as far as they're concerned, they don't want to do anything with the Roswell, with the Roswell Frequency, although... To be fair, they use the frequency and four other frequencies that we developed, they use them in, in their psychic development circles to very good effect, I might add. But anyway, um, they said, we'd like to do, we'd like to go back in the chapel, do a, a, an interview with yourself and with Patrick, just a sort of walk around, no, nothing elaborate, nothing fancy. Could you get in contact with them again mm. uh, through your contacts? Now, as Sod's Law would have it, when I got back in contact with them, both the guys that you had left, Okay, and and this is how this always works. But fortunately, 
the son of one of them, uh, a guy called Simon Beatty. Uh, his father, Stuart Beatty, was the guy that was in contact with mainly back in 2005 and the 1998. That's where that came from, the 1998. That, that, that was the first uh, Rosalind experiment was carried out then. But the last time we were back in officially was in 2005. That's when his dad, uh, si um, Stuart, was there. But um, Simon, you know, I, I got talking to Simon. I, I said who I was and it did to establish some sort of, I suppose, um, credence for myself and some background. I knew his dad and what we'd done, this, that, and the next thing, you know, that, that, that had written Rosalind Between Two Worlds, and I, they were selling it in the bookshop of Rosalind Chapel and all the rest of it. So I had some sort of credential, if you like, you know. So um, he said, oh, well, that, that's fine. I was there with a chit-chat, and, and he said, well, look, what are you actually after? Well, I told him. I said, well, what, what, what we actually want to do is uh, Patrick and Carol would like to come up would like to do a, just a walk through, nothing elaborate, there, there's going to be no, no, nothing, if you like, heavy going on, just a walk around the chapel, out of hours, <coughs> uh, uh, that, that Carol's going to film it, um, uh, Patrick and I are going to walk around the chapel, have a chat, he's going to ask the questions, and just see if it picks up, that's it. And, and, and th th probably uh, th th there will be a, a DVD produced of it, and, and that'll be it. Cool. So I said, well, look, I'll tell you what, the organising committee, the steering committee for the chapel, meet every every three months. The next meeting is next month, which is in March, and, and I'll put this to them. But send an email to us. Uh, give as much background detail as you can. You've been here in 1990 and in 2005, and you know, a relationship with my dad. When you got on well with him, we sell your book, and, and it's, sell it as best you can. So well, that's what I've done. So we're still waiting for one back from Rosalind Chapel to see if they'll let us back in again. Because we'd rather do this official. I mean, if necessary, we could do the other thing, I suppose, and just do it. But it's, it's not handy at all. So it'd be much better if we could get official permission to go in an hour before the, the you know, between the staff starting and the place being open to the public. Because we've done that twice before. And it's an, an ideal little one-hour slot to do what we've got to do. So that's what we're trying to get again, this one-hour slot where we can get, if you like, unfettered access to the chapel, and they can send one of the people around to act as a sort of chaperone, just to make sure that there's nothing untoward goes on in the chapel. But that's what we're trying to do, and hopefully we'll know by, by the beginning of next month. OK, cool. Well, I hope you'll keep us up to date with what's going on at the chapel. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. If you could explain to our listeners, Brian exactly what the, the Devil's Court is and how that is connected to Rosalind Chapel. Okay, the Devil's Court. Well, this is, is not straightforward, okay? What the Devil's Court is, basically, it, it's a musical interval called an, an augmented fourth, okay? It's C, F and A sharp, uh, uh, C sharp, F and A. I, I, I need to go and look quite frankly because there are very there are various variants on a particular frequency, but it's called an augmented fourth. Okay, yeah. now in the east end of Rosalind Chapel and what is called the Lady Chapel, which is actually a little retro choir. Um, if you look up in the ceiling, there are 328 cubes emitting from little uh, stone carved angels who are little, playing little stone instruments, and they're carrying these cubes of patterns up, 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 to the, up to the heavens, if you will. Now, on the faces of these cubes are engraved patterns, okay? Now, these patterns are identical to what are called Schladni patterns, which were created in the 18th century by a German physicist called Ernst Schladni, okay? Now, he created these patterns, which are, in effect, solid sound, now, he created this by clamping a very thin steel plate or a bronze plate by a, by, by a single point mounting, clamping it solidly onto, on, onto let's say, a table or a heavy board, sprinkling fine sand on it and blowing it with, with let's say, a violin bow or, or a double bass bow or something or a cello bow. Depending on how the, 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 the steel plate or the bronze plate is played, the, the, the note produced creates a stress pattern which is recreated by the sand on top of it, okay? Now, I believe, and not just me, I might add, because there's a guy called Stephen Pryor who is now deceased. He came up, he came up with the idea originally, but didn't I manage to follow it through, he died. But what I did was, I, I never forgot about this, because I heard about this first, about, about 19, 
1992-93 when I attended a meeting of the Sony Air Society. But at any rate, I realized that these cubes were definitely Schladney patterns, and this has since been proved conclusively that is exactly what they are. And this, mind you, it was in the 14th century. But the guy who created the chapel, Sir William Sinclair, would have had the technology to do this. It wasn't as if the technology didn't exist. It was there, and it could have happened. It would have been done. What I could did was he created a, a series of musical chords, and they are, they are shown in the patterns on the cubes, which are carved on these cubes, which arch up into the ceiling of the Lady Chapel. Okay. But from my perspective, it doesn't really matter what the, the actual musical sequence is. It's what the frequency of the music is. Okay. The, yeah. the, the devil's chord is, is one, what we know now definitely, that is one of, one of these patterns is an augmented fourth. But why would Sir William include the augmented fourth there? Well, we know also from, from the 1902 visit, the, 1990, sorry, the 1998 visit, that, that initially the, the chapel will respond to specific sounds. Okay? Now, in 2005, we recreated the devil's chord using a laptop computer and, and, and a frequency generator. We recreated the devil's chord in the chapel with permission, I mean, this is all done with permission. Now, when this happened, we knew there was a portal of sorts at the east end of the Lady Chapel, just in front of what's called the St. Matthew Altar. And we knew perfectly well that there was a, a, a portal there, because, because I'd stood in it and been lifted off my feet, strangely enough, which, which, which sort of indicated at the time there was something very strange there. Yeah. But... Um, when we recreated the Devil's Chord in 2005, now the people that were there was myself, my wife, uh, a musician, a psychologist, two of the mediums that were there in 2000, in 1998, and a, a musical thera a, a, yeah, an acoustic therapist. Now, as soon as we kicked off the Devil's Chord, the medium said, the, the, the portal is opening, it's opening now. So we stood, she stood with her back against the altar. I, I stood about five feet in front of her facing her and we could feel a column of cold air shooting up from the floor. Now, I realized that I put my hands out to my side because it became very cold in this little area, that I could put my hand out of the cold, like it was almost like putting your hand outside a box. It was slightly warmer outside. You brought your, back, your hand back in, it was cold, but inside so there was a clear shut-off point. So something was happening at this particular part of the chapel. Now, while this was going on, the acoustic therapist went downstairs into the crypt and he started toning. He had brought a whole set of um, tuning forks with him. So he, he pinged off one and started toning. So what you had then was a tone from him and the tone being created by the laptop. Now, we're all standing upstairs looking at each other, just wondering what was going to happen next. Well, the, the next thing that happened was the chapel created a resonant frequency on its own. In other words, the chapel created a third frequency. Then a wow. few seconds later, the chapel created a fourth frequency. So there was two frequencies being created by the chapel, two frequencies being created by us. Now, uh, the, the, the guy down the stairs, the acoustic therapist, uh, a, a guy called Nathan Surya, he didn't know this was going on. Now, he stopped toning. Then what happened was the fourth tone stopped, the third tone stopped, and all we were left with was the tone being created by the actual uh, laptop computer itself. So at that point, what we had to pack in because an hour was up and, and we just shut down. But it was after that we realized that the doorway was not being fully opened because we didn't have full access to the key. And it's only since then that we realized the key, the rest of the key is actually a color, and the color is red. And that, and that red, it, it, it's, a, it's a beam of red light that's projected into the chapel through what is called a, 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 it's a little uh, optical box which exists above, in the east end of the chapel, right above the rose window. And twice a year when the sun rises, it, it projects a, a dot of red light into the chapel. This is absolutely true. It does happen. It's been tested and been proven. It does actually work. And the light box still works as well. And this, mind you, was built in, in, in the 15th century, the, the, yeah. the chapel. It was built, I think it was in 1420 or 1425. So they actually built this into the chapel. The means of light of doing or of bringing the light into the chapel is there. Um, and we believe that Sir William incorporated this, uh, if you will, portal in the chapel that can be opened by sound and light. Okay? And we think we, he hid something there. Now, we're not too sure what he hid, but it's an immense secret of some kind. It could be a physical object. It could be, oh, well, I'm not going to lie to you, we don't know. We just frankly don't know. But all we know is that he definitely hid something in that chapel 
by, the, by one of the most cunning methods absolutely possible, a doorway that could only be opened by sound and by music. Oh, sorry, by sound and by light. So hopefully at some point in the future, I don't, even this year I doubt it, but at some point in the future we can actually try this out and, and see if it will open. Wow, that's an incredible story. Absolutely amazing. Um, if I could ask one other thing to, to bring back around to what what you were discussing earlier, Brian, with regards to exorcisms that you've been yeah. involved in. Yeah. Um, have you found that certain methods of exorcism work or are better than others? Well, the traditional method of exorcism is used by the Catholic Church is called the Ritual Romanum. Um, now, the Ritual Romanum is actually three rituals in one. And the, the, it usually starts off with prayer, and then it begins with, with, with a short ritual, a longer ritual, but then the final ritual. And each one, if you like, is stepping up on the one on the one previous to it, and you're actually and to, to, you're, you're commanding and demanding this thing leaves the possessed person. Now, now that's one way of doing it. Yeah. In, in my own case, when I've had to do this, I'm saying to it's actually three times, if the truth be told, in the house that I have found that a determination to get this thing out of the house, as long as you mean it, I don't think it actually matters a damn what you say. As long as you make it clear that it's not welcome there and, you, and it must get out at all costs, you're demanding it leaves your house because it doesn't belong there, this is your house, not its, and it needs you to be there more than you need it. Put it that way. Yeah. So I, I think force and determination is the best way of doing it. And, uh, but it would appear at the end of the day, uh, irrespective of who is saying it and irrespective of what has been said, it's uh, more to do with, with the desire and the will of the exorcist rather than the formal words, I think. Interesting. Finally, one, one other thing that uh, I'd like to discuss before our time's up. Is there a connection between ghosts and aliens? The, the answer to that is yes. And I'll tell you why. In 90% of the cases... Of the UFO, because I haven't investigated UFO cases, uh, both uh, people that have seen them, both uh, and, and people that have claimed to have been abducted on a regular basis. Um, in every case, there has been a paranormal connection as well. In other words, the person who has been abducted or who has regular contact with ET is guaranteed to have had some form of paranormal experience at some point, and there be more than one. And I'm talking about contact with ghosts. Uh, poltergeist activity, whatever. But but there's always a strong connection. And, and, and the reason is this, I believe, that, that because they're intimately interconnected. And the only difference between angels and aliens is in the context and in the era, because I believe that they're one and the same thing. Many people do, and uh, it is something that has recently fascinated me as well. A good, a good point. Uh, well, absolutely, because the more you... Well, <laughs> Okay, I'll put it this way. Now, this might be slightly contentious. Yeah. And it's a thing that, like many of these things, it just sort of dawns on you. It's like a blind and like, why did it not see this before? Okay. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if there are ETs, okay, and, and, and I see no reason to doubt that there aren't any, if there are ETs, they do not originate in this universe. They cannot originate in this universe, and I'll tell you why. Now, you may, not, you may not agree with this, you may, but if you don't, I'd be happy to hear your, your, your views on it. But the reason I say it is this. If you accept that the universe began with the Big Bang, okay, which is the, 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 the general accepted theory, that the universe and all it contains started from, from, from a, a singularity a bit smaller than a pea, okay, and it went kaboom, and all of a sudden the universe was created. The, the, the limitless universe, which is still expanding, apparently, okay, so it's still driving out the way. But before that universe came into creation, the universe and all it contains, and, and this is important, all it contains was contained within this pea-sized singularity, okay? So everything that is in the planet Earth, everything that is you, everything that is in the moon, everything was in that singularity, and everything else in the universe is part and parcel of what the Earth is, what you are and what the moon is, what the solar system is, okay? So every material, every element, every subatomic particle is identical no matter where you go in the universe. Now, that, that, take that and park it. The next thing we're told frequently is that there are traces found that supposed ET landing sites or where UFOs have been around. Here is a substance 
previously unknown to science. Science doesn't recognize a subject. Well, if science doesn't recognize this object or, or the component parts of this object, it cannot have originated in this universe because this universe was a, it contains everything that was in the Big Bang and the Earth and everything on it contained everything that was in the Big Bang. Therefore, if it cannot be recognized, it did not come from the Big Bang. Okay, So it must exist in some universe that is not ours. And, and that is my logic behind saying, saying what I've just said. Now, you may find fault with it, you may find holes in the logic, and if you can, I'd be delighted to hear them because I will argue the point. I'd like to, to just give you an opportunity here, Brian, to talk about your new manuscript. Well, what the manuscript was about, actually, if you look at all the books, I mean, I've written about eight or nine books now, and each one, apart, apart from one I did with Phil Gardner, tends to be a progression of the book before it because it opens up little areas that you start looking into. It's a bit like a fractal pattern, if you like. Or, you know, the, the, the more they go into it, the bigger it gets. And, and the further you go to the, the, the new bit, the bigger that gets. So you, you, you tend to find different areas, but they're all ultimately interconnected. And what the book is about is about, if you like, the history of exorcism and possession. Okay. And, and where, it, where it comes from. This is why I, I start the book... The first chapter is called Personal Demons, and it's a description of the exorcism that, that, of what appeared to be an exorcism that I underwent at work at 2 o'clock one morning, you know, which is very, very strange. Mm. But it goes on from there, and, and, and we look at shamanic exorcism because exorcism is, is common and it's regularly practiced by shamans. And the most famous exorcism of all, of course, perhaps, was the exorcism at Loudoun. You know, the, uh, the nuns at Loudoun, uh, which was made into the Devils, the Ken Russell film. And I might add to any of your listeners and to yourselves, I might add, if you go on YouTube and you type in Ken Russell's The Devils, the entire film is on YouTube, the whole 80 minutes of it. And it's an excellent it's an excellent reproduction. I've seen it. I go from there. I look at what was called The Miracle of Lyon in France, which was another exorcism. But it was, I think, an exorcism with a very political bent because it was made at a time when the Huguenots were, were uh, achieving more, more uh, influence in France, and it would appear that the church, naughty, naughty, set up an exorcism to prove the point that the Huguenots were, 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 were satanic and, and that all the demons in hell were actually Protestant, you see, which uh, it, it did quite, quite, quite effectively, I add, and I suppose it also proved that um, the church had ultimate power over the Protestant uh, idea of religion, and, and the, sort of the, 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 the exercise the young lady and all the demons that came out of her all trod off to Switzerland, which was, which was the sort of centre of the Huguenot faith at the time. And, and they all announced that they were, in fact, Huguenots. So you can see where that was all coming from. So whether it was an, a, a, a political exorcism or, or, or a genuine exorcism, it's an entirely different kettle of fish. I move on from there, quite controversially, to the televangelists. Uh, and, and that's what's called the faith movement. Now, I, I swear, and I put my hand in heart, I was appalled at what these people do in the name of religion, especially something called prosperity theology, where they claim that God wants you, want you to be rich. Simple as that. He wants you to be rich, and all you've got to do is ask for it, provide you send them money. And absolutely appalling some of the things that these guys get up to. But anyway, but I look at that, I look at Pentecostalism, the charismatic, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, um, I say prosperity theology. I also look at the carry on that went on in the uh, the cemetery or the Highgate Cemetery mm. uh, with Sean Manchester, set himself up as a vampire hunter, and also the, the doings of a guy called Montague Summers, the, the Reverend Montague Summers, and I had to claim to be a Reverend, but it's, it's doubtful. But um, he was also a, a, an, an avid exorcist and, and sort of hounder of all things satanic and evil. And, and part two of the book is based on stuff that I did myself. I was involved for a long time in the remote exorcism of a woman who lived in Guadalajara in Mexico. And I never met her. I, I, I've never even spoken to her on the phone. But there was a psychic battle fought. By, uh, the guy I mentioned there with Patrick McNamara. He fought a psychic battle against whoever was uh, attacking her in Mexico, in Guadalajara in Mexico. And, what, and the way we set it up was using the particular Roslyn frequency. Uh, I JPEG a, a sound file, and Patrick has one of the DVDs anyway. And we arranged at the same time 
for them both to put the uh, the, the, the sound, put the file on. She was using a computer, and Patrick would be using it being a, I guess, a, a CD player. Mm. But they, they did it exactly the same thing. It was to create, if you like, a point of resonance across the planet. And and Patrick did what he had to do on a psychic level to get, to get rid of this thing that, that was destroying her, destroying her house, destroying her son. But apparently, she only, he only managed to, if you like, delay uh, and, and sort of calm things down a bit because it calmed down for a while, kicked off again. And he had to carry out a second very similar exorcism, which, as far as I know, and I say I say as far as I know because I haven't heard for, from her for about six or months now, it appears to work. Because I, I can only judge the fact that I haven't heard from her, therefore she's not having any more trouble. Mm. So the second exorcism seems to work. But um, basically, the book sort of continues in, in that general, in general sort of um, vein. Uh, and uh, like I say, it, it includes other exorcisms that have been involved in it first hand, um, some of the stuff that I've seen, uh, and, and basically that, that's it, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> suppose. <laughs> that's it, that sounds an extremely complex and detailed look at exorcism, amazing. Right, we're running out of time. It's been fantastic, as always, to speak to you. You're such a charismatic person, and it's always great to have you associated with Weird and, and coming on the show. So thank you for giving up your time. Absolutely. You're more than welcome. Any time at all, give us a shout. Only too happy to speak good to, to, to you and, and to Weird. No, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, and you take care, yeah? Okay, mate. You take God bless, mate. So that was Brian Allen, a fantastic interview. Brian, as always, just makes me smile when he talks. And I, thought, I must say, his, his theory of why there's no life elsewhere in the universe lost me slightly. And I'd like possibly the opportunity to talk to him about that again at some point in the future. But what did you think, Rhys? Well, his theory certainly doesn't, um, in my mind, preclude the existence of extraterrestrials or any other kind of new phenomena or material throughout the universe, although he does make a very good point in that what you would expect to find elsewhere, you would also find on Earth, but perhaps um, maybe in different ratios of substances. Okay, well, I'd say it was great to have Brian on the show, and he always uh, comes up with some interesting theories, and and I love the guy to death for it. So that's the end of this show, Rhys. It's been great fun. And on the next show, we have another Scottish researcher, the one and only Malcolm Robinson, who has a history going back with weird, ooh, all the way back to 2009 when he first did a conference for us down in Warminster, of all places. So we're looking forward to speaking to Malcolm. But until then, I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the show, and we'll see you all very, very soon. So it's bye from me. And it's bye from me.